No, I had something marked from last week I wanted to ask, but I didn't get a chance. What's up, Emily? Hey, how are you? Yeah, how are you? Good. Hi, Emily. It's Jack, Jack and Fran are here. Hi, Jack and Fran. How are you guys doing? Great. How, how are your kids? They're good. They're doing well. Um, they're at home right now. I'm actually, I started coming to the 830 service so that I could come to this and then I volunteer with Sunday school. So they'll be here later. Mm. How, are, how are you guys? Great. Good. Let us, uh, let us pray and then we'll, uh, we'll get to it. Oh, good and gracious God, we give thanks for this day, for the ability to read scripture, the ability to understand scripture, and to, to learn and grow and to be formed by it, Lord. Uh, we give thanks for the, the sun and the rain, and uh, even give thanks for flat tires, Lord. <laughs> and uh, as we go about this week, let, let us rejoice in who you are and to who you make us. Lord, it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So we're going to be in chapter four. We're going to look at one through 17 first. And then if time allows, we'll do 18 through 31. So chapter four. Then Moses answered, but suppose they do not know, they do not believe me or listen to me, but say the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw the staff on the ground, and it became a snake. And Moses drew back from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. So he reached out his hand and grasped it, and it became a staff in his hand. So that they may believe that the Lord and the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. He put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, his hand was leprous, as white as snow. Then God said, put your hand back into the cloak. So he put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his body. If they will not believe you or heed the first sign, then they may believe the second. If they will not believe even these two signs or heed you, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent neither in the past nor even now that you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what to say. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, what of your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know that he can speak fluently. Even now he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, his heart will be glad. You shall speak to him and put the words into his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you what you shall do. He indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth for you and you shall serve as God for him. Take in his hand, take in your hand the staff with which you shall perform the signs. A lot of stuff. A lot of good stuff there. Uh, so let's look at uh, names real fast. We obviously have Moses and the Lord Yahweh. And then we see the addition of a new character who is Aaron. Aaron is a Levite. 
so he says your brother Aaron is Moses and e and Eva a Levite. I just thought about that when you said that. I assume so. I think he is. Is it not familial? Well, we don't, nobody really knows. It's one of those things where the Hebrew word of brother here is also used oftentimes through like community brother and like brotherhood, um, which is the only Hebrew word for brother though. So there's not any like family brother word um, that would be like, oh, that means his actual brother. But we also don't necessarily know too much about Moses's parents, right? Mother has him, hides him, puts him in the Nile. We don't hear anything about his father, of his father's descendant. Except we do know that Moses is a descendant of Jacob. There is a line of genealogy there. Uh, Moses could definitely be a Levite. I don't think it changes anything necessarily. Um, especially since Aaron and Moses kind of work as one in this. Um, what's important about Levites, though, that happens later? It happens because of Aaron. Aaron is the, 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 the head of this change. Levites are then, they become known as the priest. The priest. That's right. It's not how you spell priest, is it? Whatever. Yeah, they're not entitled to a portion of the land of the division. Yeah, so the Levites become the priestly class. They, you'll see, we, we'll look at, I don't think we, maybe we will, I don't remember. Yeah, Aaron's descendants are all of the priests. Um, and you're right, they don't get land, but they don't need the land because they're the priest all. And so they are kind of scattered amongst the other tribes. Um, but yeah, so it's important just that it's important to know that Aaron is a Levite and that the Levites become priests, and Aaron is the OG. So uh, in Exodus 2, it oh. actually does say that. Um, so Moses is a Levite because it says in Exodus 2, now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And then she hid him for three months. So biologically, he is a Levite. Yeah. Does that mean that Aaron is his actual brother or his clan brother? Again, that's hard to tell. It's a cool, I think it's fine to think that he's his real brother. Nothing wrong with it. I don't think it changes anything to the story if they're brothers or not. They clearly know each other. They clearly have an affinity for each other. Uh, his heart will be glad when he sees you. We'll see later that Aaron ends up kissing Moses. Uh, so they're they're a close pair, nonetheless. Uh, but it's also curious as to like how did Aaron survive? Well, that's what I was just thinking. You know, if he wasn't. I guess we don't know if Aaron is the firstborn or not. I think that's part of that. I mean, only firstborns were being killed, uh, oh, as yeah. is the trend that we'll see continue here. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Lots, lots of questions there, but a lot of questions that don't necessarily need answers to find the theological importance to the story. Um, so yeah, let's jump to the next big stuff, which are, of course, the signs. What's, <clears throat> what, what are the signs? Let's just do that first. Sign number one. The, the, the um, snake turns to the staff. Staff turns into a snake. So yeah, staff turns into the snake. And, and then the back to staff. The staff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, staff to snake, and then snake to staff. All right, what's number two? The hand. Yep, the leprous hand. We're going to talk about the importance of all of these here in a second. Because they do have an importance. And the third one. Yeah. 
Take water. <laughs> from the if Nile. Take water from the Nile. You'll pour it on dry land and it will be blood. All right. So clearly we have threefold sign and three big important number. Uh, not a mistake that it's three, right? This is where I get booted by a lot of scholars when I say that the bush was a sign. It's because if it was, it would then make it four, and that's four is not as cool as a number in the Bible. Uh, but this is a, a threefolded sign and, and teaching and gift from God, and we'll we see a lot of that happen uh, throughout Scripture. Um, so were there threefold examples before this? I, I can't remember. I don't think about it that way. Uh, I think your Genesis wrote that. Twelves. <laughs> Twelves so there. Yeah. Uh, I've had to think a little hard about it. I would want to say yes. There's definitely something of threes in Genesis. I just can't think of it. But I mean, numbers wise in Bible, we've got threes, 10, 7, 12, 40. 40, thank you. And I think well, Noah has three sons, right? Yeah, 30. Yeah, so basically what you got is, you know, three times 10, you get 30. 70 is another big number. Four, though, doesn't make the mix, even though you got 40 days and 40 nights. Part of that is it's too close to three. Oh. And when we talk about Trinitarian things, obviously three is an important number in that, uh, and you don't want to mess with it. Is 40 the suffering number? Oh. Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could look at it that way, but like, I interpret scripture in a way in which passion is positive. So like, I wouldn't necessarily look at 40 as being bad. And I also wouldn't necessarily say suffering is bad either. But it, that, is, that would be fair to say that 40, I mean, the 40 days of you know, test and trial in the desert. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That could be fair too. Uh, but nonetheless, it is a, a divisible of 10, so that's fine. 12, obviously, 12 tribes, 12 disciples. Well, with all due respect, I think that not including the burning bush is specious. <laughs> I mean, I think... You could maybe leave out the water of the Nile. I think, well, uh, well so let's, let's talk about why. Let's talk about these signs. So we'll look at number one and the snake first. Why, why the snake? What is that? What's the yeah, theological it's left over from the Garden of Eden? Yeah, Genesis three. Snake. Exactly. Snake. Genesis three. The Israelites at that time would have known the creation story. Maybe right? they would have understood and they would have known. Thanks, Catherine. The apple, the snake, being deceived by a snake. Snakes were viewed terribly, which honestly they should still be because snakes were gross and disgusting, but. <laughs> that's my own personal take on snakes. Uh, oh yeah, Genesis three. That's the obvious connection there with that sign. Um, what about leprous? This is this one's maybe a little. I dig a little deeper on this one, but what do we know about leprosy at this time? The skin disease. Most scholars believe that it was more of a rash and not the disease that we call leprosy now. It was, yeah, I mean, it was. But people were afraid of it. They didn't want to touch or be touched by anyone who got you, got you thrown out of the house. <laughs> Say that again. It got you thrown out of the house. You and thus, what? Inside. If you're thrown out of the house, you no longer have familiar connection. Community. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and there were community of lepers though. 
So exactly. you have a community. So you become this outcast. Yeah. You get thrown onto the margins. You get, you know, lost ultimately. It's and like so love for felons now. Pulling out a leprous hand would then cause folks to then say, like, well, you know, I'm not going to touch you. Stay away from us. And then for him to get it to go away, you know, God restores him back into community. That's, I talk, I preached one time about um, the um, Legion. And even Legion, who wasn't necessarily leprous, but had a thing that was making him not be a part of community. But in the end, we see Legion healed and restored, and then thus asking to go along with Jesus, right? And what does Jesus tell him? No, go back to your town. Go and show yourself to the priest. Tell them of what has happened, right? Jesus restores him to community. That is the power that God has over things like leprosy. That's why you see leprosy is just big. Leprosy is a big, just a big term in scripture. We don't really know what it means. We don't really know what the disease is, but like it's something that keeps you away from everybody else, puts you on the margins. Um, it could mean a various things. Uh, Norman Wurzba looks at leprosy a lot because he likes to look at it through the eyes of like creation and things like that. Um, too smart for me. Um, but yeah, so this one, again, maybe a little far stretching, but understanding the rest of scripture, I think we can make that jump to this being why this sign is important. Um, what about number three? What do we know about the Nile and blood? That, that, also, goes, that goes back to the burning bush. It's, it's like nature not doing right. You know, here's this water. It's not doing right when it turns into blood, you know. So it's a credit to God being over all creation, right? I mean, that God has that control to burn a bush without actually burning it, to turn the Nile bloody. Um, I wonder, too, if it's significant that you know, at the wedding of Cana, he turns water into wine. And like as sacrament, like we take wine to represent blood or as blood, whichever to subscribe to. And I don't know what my conclusion is on that. I just, it made me think of that. For sure. I think that, you know, there might be a, a far reaching connection, but a connection nonetheless. Um. There is a more direct foreshadowing here. And I think you were on the path. What were you about to say? I, I don't. I don't know. Right. Uh, are you you talking about like when the the uh, when the Pharaoh wouldn't let the uh, people go? That's that's when it happened. Yeah, it's one of the plagues. Uh huh. I go. The Nile. Turns to blood mm -hmm. in Exodus 7 yeah, but as one of the first plagues. Uh, here, the Nile is still water, but when you pour it on dry land, it's blood. So it's not the Nile turning into blood, but it's a foreshadowing of what is to come and what is possible. Um, so. Well, you know, all of these things are possible in, in today's. If, if you have water running over, the land that's been cleared, it turns into something that looks like blood, that sort of thing. And the wind blows and the seed parts, the sea rises. So, you know, we got science that can explain all these. And so we give them meaning when we. I don't know. If we've got staffs turning into snakes, I don't want to be here. <laughs> well, have you ever been out in this, this, this little stick and all of a sudden it's not a stick anymore? <laughs> it I, I, I've never had that. I pray to God I never do have that. Okay, well, so take it from me. All <laughs> these things can be explained. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, lepers, I mean, we still have oh, yeah, skin still diseases. Have I mean, we, I think, I think about cancer patients. 
I mean, how do we treat cancer patients? Yeah, you know, we, we want to care. We want to offer love and grace. We want to be helpful providers, but also like, mm, yeah, stay, stay away. You know, you've, oh, you've been in the hospital. Like, ah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, so I mean, we, it's, these are all still pretty relevant. I'm cool, we're trucking along. Um, so what about that last part that we talked about? Moses claims he can't speak. What's up with that? Maybe it's an excuse, you know. I can't do that. I'm not going to step up and do that. Yeah, I think we, my notes, I use the Wesley Study Bible, by the way, which is a really great Bible. Um, shameless plug. Uh, my notes talk about, you know, is this an actual speech impediment on Moses' part? Because he does continue to bring it up, that he's not a good speaker, uh, that he's failed of speaking, I think is the language that's given to him later in Exodus. We, we just don't know. You know, I mean, even if he has a speech impediment, if God's able to do these things, why wouldn't God be able to allow Moses to speak without the speech impediment, if that's the worry? Uh, but what do what do we see God's response? What what is, how does God respond? Moses says it twice, right? It starts getting angry, showing impatience with the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. This is the start of Moses not being allowed into the promised land. Okay, God's anger is kindled. This is a theme between God and Moses, right? We'll see it as we continue moving forward. Uh, and, and ultimately, right after the manna story, God tells Moses, you will not go, you will not make it into the promised land. You will die before you get there. Because of things that Moses says, oh, you know, I, I can't, or, you know, God, I, I question this, or why, why are you doing this for these people? Or even in a positive sense, he corrects God and says, hey, you, you, can't, you can't kill us all, because remember the covenant that you made with us. Um, so Moses clearly has this very unique relationship with God that allows him the chance to be in dialogue and to be in real dialogue not just you know the Lord tells him to do something and he goes and do it but like God allows Moses to ask questions God allows Moses to express his worries and concerns about what he's being asked to do not that it doesn't end up being to a detriment of Moses but he's allowed to do it, and ultimately God still empowers them to do all of the things. This doesn't necessarily become the end of their relationship. I mean, very easily, we talked about this last time, God could have said, you know what, Moses, you're right. You're not the man for the job. I'll find somebody else. <laughs> and we see that happen in elsewhere. Like We see that happen, and God clearly has the ability to empower and to you know, be with different folks throughout time. That's why we have different prophets and different prophecy um but god doesn't do that here <clears throat> instead we know that god sends aaron who is fluent in speaking um which i guess is super important in terms of you know talking to large groups of people uh, i think the the one thing though about that is that it um it shows it shows how God is in relationship with Moses, right? So that it's not just Moses talking to God, but God is answering back to Moses and providing him with things that, you know, if in Moses's mind, this is something that holds him back from doing what he's supposed to do, God is going to provide him 
with what God needs for whatever he needs to, to serve God, basically. Yeah, I mean, and this is this is a threefold response in itself. You know, first time, God, what's your name? And God answered, gives him a name. Well, God, what if they don't believe me? Here are these signs. They should believe you with these signs. God, I can't speak. Here's Aaron, who can then speak for you. Right, so this is a, another threefold, three, you know, series of three that we see grouped together very closely here in Scripture that gets to Moses being able to be who he needs to be for God um, and God answering and providing that for him. What what do we take away from the last, not the last verse, second to last verse? He indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth to you, and you, being Moses, shall serve as God for him. When so, you read that out loud, that was the first time that that had struck me. It's just usually you're reading kind of on right past it. Does you shall serve as God? So he's the translator, perhaps. Yeah. If you're God, how are you going to serve? Well, well, more the source rather than the translator. Which, what does that mean? Like, what when we're saying that, what are, what are we truly meaning when we say Moses? When God is saying Moses, you are going to be the source for Aaron. Looking at it through the lens of what we know about the Aaronic priesthood, we are giving those people extra credibility. They've gotten the word from Moses himself. And Moses got it from God himself. Right. Yeah, that, I think that's critical, right? Because he doesn't act independently. He's acting on behalf of God because God told him. So why why would God not just say, you'll be his translator? You'll be the intermediate. Well, why does he even need anybody between God and Aaron? Well, he's, he says, you shall be God for him. That is, a, insofar as I know, a unique role that does not occur anywhere else in Scripture. Yeah, so I think we have to think about this in the way in which Israelite people understood God. Um, we think about like God the Father language. That's pretty common for us, God as Father. Um, but we don't get that until we get Jesus. God's referred to in the Old Testament as the God of your Father of Jacob, of Abraham, of Isaac. Not once in the Old Testament, and if it's in your Old Testament, it's a translation issue. Not once in the Old Testament is God referred to as the Father. Only Jesus is the one who calls him Abba, which is the familiar father. Uh, and so Moses being that source for Aaron, who then can share that with the rest of the Israelite people. This becomes the God of Moses, right? It, it adds that extra layer. And it's hard for us to think about, especially as Protestant people, who oftentimes relish in the fact that we're able to talk directly to God. And I think that's a beautiful thing. But we have to look at this from the lens of how the Israelite people were communicating with God. And oftentimes it was through somebody else who had the divine ability to also talk to God, like a Moses, like an Abraham, 
like an Isaac and a Jacob, right? So that's where I think this is another one of those where like Moses is truly giving his prophetic credit for lack of a better word. Like, you know, instead of his street cred, he's getting his prophetic cred. Whereas like you will be God for Aaron and thus the Israelite people. Not to say that Moses becomes God, but that they will need to go through you to get to God. Well, what, what that means is that what Moses tells Aaron cannot be denied or controverted. And therefore, what Aaron and the Aaronic priests tell the people cannot be denied by extension. Yeah. Yeah, it is the word of God. For them, the people of God. Yeah. So, I mean, like, you, like, we really have to, when we're reading the Old Testament, we have to read it as Old Testament folk. There's definitely Christology in this that we can pull out, and that's fair and fine and dandy, and I do that a lot as well. But if you truly want to understand Old Testament, you have to read it as an Old Testament person, as an Israelite. Um. Uh, that's not to say that you don't like just to forget about Jesus, because as we already made the argument, Jesus and the Trinity is here in the Old Testament. That's there. So like, it's not that, but it's understanding it how they would have understood it. And it's actual cultural, environmental, contextual space. And so understanding that it's God of Moses the God of Abraham. That just helps us better understand even, that even helps us better understand the use of father in a place in which that might particularly not be the best terminology to use for God. Now, I use the term father, but I use it in the sense that Jesus does, not in the sense of like an earthly father, because God's not an earthly father. God is God. And God is way beyond being anything we understand, right? Ineffable. Um, but yeah. That's all I got for the first part, which is why I added the opportunity to do the second part. Uh, and I think the second part is a little bit more interesting. So we're going to read 18 through 31 real quick, and then we'll talk about it. So... Uh, God just told him to take up the staff that you will perform the signs. And Moses went back to his father-in-law Jethro and said to him, please let me go back to my kindred in Egypt and see whether they are still living. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. The Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all those who are seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons, put them on a donkey went back to the land of Egypt, and Moses carried the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Moses, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I said to you, let my son go that he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. Now I will kill your firstborn son. On the way at a place where they spent the night, the Lord met him and tried to kill him. But Sipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched it to Moses' feet and said, Truly you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he left him, so he let him alone. It was then she said, A bridegroom of blood by circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and he met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him and all the signs with which he was charged, in which he had charged him. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the Israelites. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses 
perform the signs in front of the sight of all the people. The people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had given heed to the Israelites, and that he had seen their mercy, they bowed down and worshipped. A lot of stuff there. So let's go back to names. Just to get them all. So we see Jethro come back, father in law. Jethro. Uh, the poor are coming back. 18. 18 is coming back. We see Zipporah, and we see. This is not necessarily a name, but ne but is a, an addition of potentially somebody else. Um, it says, we have the Pharaoh. Yes, we have Pharaoh. Well, Pharaoh's not really there. They just talk about Pharaoh. Uh, thankfully. Um, da, 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 there it is, 20. So Moses took his wife and his sons, plural sons. So we obviously know the firstborn son, Gershom. Right? Yeah. But clearly there's at least one more. And we don't ever actually get to know who or what they are. But they're there. We know that Moses has at least two sons. Um, I don't know if that's important or not, but I guess it is. It's good to know. So let's talk then. So Jethro gives some approval. You can go. They're making their way back through the wilderness. We see later that they're at the mountain of God, which is where the burning bush was, which is also called Mount Horeb, and which is also called Mount Sinai. That's terrible spelling, but let's not. Yeah. So the map that I showed last week, same place, working their way back down, up and over to Egypt. Um, and then we get to 24, which is just very much like, even in just a literary sense, completely interrupts the story. It goes from having God talking to Moses to then the narrator talking about what God's doing, which just hasn't happened in the chapter before here. Like, this is the first time we see that kind of happen. It says, on the way at a place where they spent the night, the Lord met him and tried to kill him. Is he Moses? Oh, that's my question. Who is he? Because then it also, right before that, it said, you refused to let him go. Now I will kill your firstborn son. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, he met Moses and killed his firstborn son. He said, tried. Troy. The Lord met him and tried. I mean, if the Lord tries to kill somebody, he's going to go zap and then go, oh, didn't work. let me try something else. That's a very puzzling sense. That's, that's, a, a, that's a symbol of going back, you know, the sacrificing your first child type thing, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, so if we want to talk about the Lord trying to kill somebody, we have to talk about Jacob. About in which Jacob wrestled with the Lord and got his Achilles yanked off. You're telling me the Lord couldn't just win? Like, I agree. Like, I agree with your sentiment, but like, we see God try. And, and I, you know, I think. I think the Lord gives us an opportunity to uh, correct. And we, we see that. We see Zephora's action. Well, you, you made a good point, but, but these are statements of the biblical narrator. 
And so it's the interpretation of a third party. It's not God saying, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. Yeah, so we don't really know what try is, right? Like, I mean, could just be that like God was going to kill, but then... Well, he had his, his, had his hand up or whatever. And yeah. then Zipporah took the flint and cut off the foreskin and touched his feet with it. Mm. And says, truly, you're a bridegroom to me, to Zipporah. Bridegroom of blood to me. And then he <laughs> left him alone. So I assume that's he, God. But so the... Yeah. We don't know the him. I'll I'll give you that. Is it the son? Is it Gershom? Is it Moses? Mm. Well, and when Gaffney says that everywhere it says he in the Old Testament, it's not really necessarily uh, masculine. So it could be God or it could be. I even have a note next to the Moses when it says Moses' feet. Mm -hmm. I have a note that just says that's the Hebrew word for his. Well, my, my and that the translator is, yeah. added in Moses. Right. So if you take even that out, it makes it even more confusing of like, well, is this the son or is this Moses? Like, with Moses being in there, it makes you think maybe it's Moses. Mm -hmm. I, I would think that's how I've always read it uh, before now. Um, and now I don't know. And I'm cool not knowing. One of the best things about divinity school is you learn that there's a lot of things you're not going to be able to learn. Well, at least it and you got to learn to figure out how to be okay. With it. Right. There are places where they don't see it that way. But well, happily we do. When you're at Duke Divinity, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. So we don't know who him is, but we do appear to see why God is coming to kill either Moses. Or Gershom, which is what? Well, if you're only looking at this part of the text, it says because he's a bridegroom of blood. So okay, right, but so we know so we know that God is coming to kill one of them. Right. And we see Zipporah do what? Take a flint and cut off the circumcises her son. So God was coming because the firstborn was not circumcised. Right? If she circumcises the son and then God's like, you know, okay, I'm not going to kill you. Clearly that was the reason. Like that, was, that was why God was coming to kill. Which makes sense. Moses is an Israelite. But therefore, Moses' son is an Israelite. And tradition of Israelite culture the circumcision of the firstborn, typically all male. So Moses didn't get circumcised at, right after his birth because Gershom. Well, the poor took a flint and cut off her sons. Her sons, which is Gershom. Which would be Gershom. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we are to assume that Moses is circumcised, I guess. Um, well, I wonder if you're here. trying to hide him as not being an Israelite would, would I mean, I think with having Israelite midwife there, that it probably would, he probably would have just been circumcised. But we see that the son clearly was. And, and there's nothing in any biblical text about anyone trying to deny Moses being an Israelite. So yeah. we have a right to assume that he was probably circumcised. And in Egypt, that, that was one of the key tell signs of who's an Israelite and who wasn't. Uh, which in our world today is hard to imagine, but like, that was one of the signs because uh, they weren't vastly different in terms of appearance. Uh, of course, you know, Middle Eastern, African. Um, culturally, they were different, obviously, but you know, circumcision was one of those outward signs that differentiated them from everybody else. Yeah, so we see Zephorah cut off the foreskin. She then touches it who, who we assume is Moses' feet, which we all know feet in the Bible actually doesn't mean feet, uh, which makes this even weirder. But 
But then she does say, truly, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. Do you have any idea what that could be? Are you saying to her son? I think she said it to Moses. <laughs> okay. She took off her, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin, touched his, I assume, her son's feet with it, and said, Truly, you are a bridegroom of blood to me, to Moses, and not to girl. Well, I think, <laughs> I think we can assume she's maybe touching the foreskin to Moses's. Uh, I do think that the translation there probably is more correct. Mostly because I don't know I don't know why she would touch her foreskin back to where she just cut it off from. And we also need to look at what does bridegroom of blood mean? Okay, any any guesses as to bridegroom of blood? Any biblical notes in your Bibles? I looked up the Hebrew word for bridegroom. It is Hatan. <clears throat> and so Hatan in scripture is I think I remember right. It's like a hundred and something times. And like 98% of the times it's translated as bridegroom. And that's in reference to like the language of the church being the bride and God being the bridegroom. And so that, that language, that's what it's being used there for. However, in other Semitic languages, this could also be translated to mean protect or circumcise. So if we said protection of blood, what does that make your mind think of? Protection of blood. We can do a little Christology here. You can take it all the way to substitutionary atonement if you want to. Washed by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely where you could take it. Um, truly, you are the bridegroom of blood to me. You know, I think, and her saying that, you know, recognizes that in circumcision, something happens. Right, that like it is a form of protection from God, especially for a firstborn. And so for Sephora, who's a Midian, to even understand that shows that Moses is probably doing a little bit of evangelizing with them, you know, teaching her, you know, the strict Israelite ways that proper Israelite, because Midians are like mildly Israelite. Uh, but the Israelites in Egypt, what their culture. So for her to know, I got to do this. Um, and this is also the role of the mother. Uh, only twice in scripture does a man circumcise another man. More often than not, it is seen as a mother or a mother-like figure doing the circumcision. So this is also her kind of completing her entrance as an Israelite as well and performing this with her son. When they talked about them coming, they said Zephora and her two sons. You know, nowadays we say a son or a child is from the father, but you know, they they did theirs from their mother. Interesting. Well, her, so it says her two sons. Before and her two sons. I'm trying to remember exactly where the switch is, but there's a switch in scripture, even as to where we deem who we are from father 
to mother. So at this time, identification comes from your father. So Gershom is Israelite, because Moses is. However, we see the switch. And I guess you could probably make the argument with Mary and Jesus, given that there's not a father outside of God the Father. Uh, but we do see that switch happen. Um, and particularly even secular world. What? In the secular world, I mean, we, we see folks, ultimately, you can kind of decide as to who, you know, if you come from a, a mixed race family, you can claim both now, but like that used to not be a thing. And so like, even in like Greek world, you know, you were Roman by your mother. Paul was a Roman because his mom was a Roman. So we see that switch happen somewhere. So it's not too wild for me to see this come off as Moses, Sephora, and his two sons. Because we also talk a lot about, and we know a lot about, uh, you know, men having multiple wives, baby carriers, baby mamas, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and so like all of those sons are their sons. It doesn't necessarily matter who their mom is. Um, except for some instances like Ishmael, things like that. Um, but yeah, so that, that switch does happen uh, in scripture. And I had to ask Dr. Wagner a little bit more about where exactly he kind of pinpoints that switch happening in the New Testament. Um, but yeah. So it's kind of a ceremonious act for her to do the circumcision for her son uh, and for her son to get circumcised to become a true firstborn Israelite um, who we see firstborns become targeted. You know, especially, you know, Israel is my firstborn. Let them go. And if you don't, we're going to kill your firstborn. The Pharaoh, right? Uh, and I'm sure that has to do a little, if I was fair, I'd be a little worried, you know. When I'm not the firstborn son in my family, even so, tough for my brother. But, <laughs> um, yeah, anything else that's 24 through 26 is just crazy, okay? Let's call it what it is. It's just crazy. Um, but it's interesting. Definitely interesting. So 27 through 21, we see Aaron come to him in the wilderness. They met him on the mountain of God. Aaron kisses him. Sign of affinity and of honor uh, at the time. Shows that Aaron already has this understanding that Moses is of some sort of authority over him. Might just be age. You know, especially if Moses is his brother, he might be his older brother. That would endure a kiss from the younger brother. Don't tell my brother I said that. Uh, and then they they get to, to Egypt. They assemble all of the elders of Israel. Uh, so at least 11 of them. Uh, right? I mean... Assume Aaron maybe represents the Levites. Maybe not. Maybe there's a, a Levite elder who comes as well. Um, and Aaron speaks all of the words that the Lord spoke to Moses. Right? That goes back to the Moses being God over, over Aaron. He performs the signs and the sight of all the people. Which has always interested me because if we look back at the beginning... God says, you know, you can perform these signs. But he kind of, a, <clears throat> at the end, he says, you know, show these signs, you know, so you shall perform the signs. But in the beginning, he's kind of like, well, if you need to use these. But then we see that Moses uses them. So I, I don't know, like, if they, we don't see the Israeli people push back. We just see that Moses kind of says all the words, or Aaron says all the words, Moses maybe does all the signs. You know, it, doesn't, just, it doesn't say Moses does the signs. In my translation, it says Aaron in 30, Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord has spoken to Moses, 
and to perform the signs in the sight of the people, which is Aaron performing them, not Moses. Yeah, I mean, I guess like as a team, I would say. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's, I don't know if I would dig too far as to who did the signs. I was thinking more so along the lines of that the signs happened, that they felt the need to do the signs to convince the people. I guess I find this the switch switching between Moses and Aaron and probably for me seems to have some relevance, but I'm not sure what it is. And as you said, maybe maybe it's irrelevant. Yeah, I mean I guess I guess there could be. I think the only reason I think it becomes irrelevant is because we have the language there to which Moses now acts as God to Aaron. And so it's understandable that Moses is telling Aaron all of these things and Aaron is just doing all the things Moses tells him. So whether it's Moses doing it or Aaron doing it, they're kind of acting as one through this. Like Moses or Aaron is just the mouthpiece. Not just, but like Aaron is the mouthpiece. And so I don't, I don't know. I don't, I wouldn't put a lot of stock into who's specifically okay. doing what. Let's see if it comes up again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we see that the Israelites saw that God had taken heed and seen their misery and they bowed down and worshiped. So well, Moses has got, got the Israelites on his side and we'll see what he can do with them. So let us pray and then we'll head on out of here. And we'll go and worship. We will. Mm -hmm. Oh, good and gracious God, we give thanks for this day, for the love that you offer each of us, and for the ability and the joy to dive into your scriptures, Lord. Uh, we give thanks for this beautiful day and for this week that is coming about, Lord. Let it be glorious to you. Let us go into worship this morning with open hearts, open minds, and open souls, Lord. Let us hear your words as we need to hear them. Lord, it is in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. So next time is at Exodus 5, 1 to 23.